So we are finishing this series that we started six weeks ago. We are in week six. We've been studying the, the letter, the book of Galatians, and, and this is a New Testament letter. It's written by Paul, just as he's written last, uh, several um, of the New Testament books. Um, this, just like a lot of his letters, are written to a specific community, uh, a certain group of churches that, that heard the gospel message, um, that, um, again, Paul started um, this church there and then uh, passed on leadership as he moved on to continue to spread the gospel to these other Gentile um, cities. And, but just like every church, right, the church in Galatia had some issues. And just as we talked about last week, there's no perfect church. I mean, including this one is not a perfect church. But we're doing everything we can to strive to be that way, right, to reflect Christ in all we do. And, and a lot of these letters are, are Paul writing back to these churches and explaining these issues, right? And saying, hey, don't forget, you know, refocusing them back to Christ or addressing different things. And, and this letter of uh, the letter to Galatians, as we've seen through our study, right, is a very personal and passionate letter by Paul. The kind of backstory of it was, was these, um, there were Jewish Christian missionaries that were kind of coming in behind Paul um, and teaching a false teaching, a false gospel to this church, right? Um, telling these new Gentile converts, right, to Christianity that they then needed to live under the law. But again, only certain parts of the law. They were talking about them being circumcised and about, again, uh, celebrating certain holidays, right, and, and events from the law. And Paul starts by by passionately defending the true gospel, right? And again, that's where we started. We looked at what, what is the true gospel and how, well, how is that taught, right? And, and we know the genuine one, so then when we hear a false one, right, it's obvious right away. Hey, we see, again, this, this Paul's personal defense of his own teaching and of his own integrity. We see as he kind of, you know, um, again, calls them back to say, never stray from the true gospel, right? Because it will lead you down a wrong path. And then we saw just in these last few weeks, as, as the letter turns a corner and it moves towards not the what's wrong, but now how do we move forward from this place, right? And what is the, how do we move forward in a positive direction? And last week, we ended at, at the end of, of Galatians chapter 5. And, and so I want to go back to kind of this, this um, theme verse that we saw from last week, Galatians 5 verse 25, where it says, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Again, as we see this, right, this truly is the gospel message, right, that, that we, when we receive Christ as our Savior, we turn from the world, we turn from our own selfish ways, we turn from our sinful nature, right, and we put our eyes on Jesus. We acknowledge his, um, his divine, you know, mission as Messiah, that he lived his sinless life, died on a cross, conquered sin and death in the resurrection, so it stepped in our place, right, to purchase our salvation and to restore our relationship with our creator, right, and that's, again, that's how we join the journey of faith. We receive Christ our Savior. We surrender to his will and to his way. We confess and we receive forgiveness, right, so that we could be made new in Christ, and again, we celebrated that even last week with baptisms, right, and that, that, that ceremony that represents that change, right, of of being washed clean by the blood of Christ and, and then being a new creation, right, and taking on our new identity as God's child and moving in a new direction. I know we saw last week, we ended right, with some very practical steps that he gives at the end of chapter 5. Okay, on, on now, how do we now live in a new direction as we live in the Spirit every day? Okay, and with each step kind of came a challenge and one of the things we gave you last week was to the first thing he gives us in verse 24, and that is to, is to crucify your sinful passions and desires on the cross. And again, you had a chance to come forward and put stuff on the cross last week. Okay, but the challenge, though, when we put stuff on the cross is to, to not bring it back, right? To, to not take it back onto our own shoulders. And, and notice what you guys put on the cross last week is still on the cross because I hope that it actually is still there, that you haven't taken it back this week. Okay, but notice, though, on there is that it's been covered in the blood of Christ. Right? It's been paid for. It's been redeemed, right? And um, it's there because it's on Christ, right? He carries that burden. In fact, he says, just give it to me. Let me carry it. Okay, and so, again, I hope it's still up there, right? Those cards are still there. 
Okay, but notice Christ covers them in his blood. Right, whether you put something on the cross last week or not, just know that that is symbolic right, of Christ taking your burdens, right? Taking what, what you put up there, what you need to crucify on that cross, right? So you can move forward and it's behind you because it's covered in the blood of Jesus. And then we follow the Spirit's leading in our life and in every area of our life. Okay, and once we receive Christ, now we just, we're in that transformation process, right, of figuring out how we do that, right, how we, we give him. And then we get embrace and be a functioning member of God's body, of the church. All right, and so these are, again, general steps and, and ways forward, right, to live by the Spirit. Now, today we're going to um, wrap up the letter. We're looking at chapter 6. We're going to look at this first section in Galatians chapter 6. So if you have your Bible with you, open with me to Galatians chapter 6. We're going to start with this, these first six verses, um, and, and there's a pattern here in these uh, first six verses where um, Paul moves on from these general steps, and now he starts to dive a little deeper. He takes us to the next level, right, of how we li- truly live by the Spirit's leading in our life. Okay, he zooms in deeper, and, and he gives us um, a directive, right, and then a very specific warning connected to that directive. Okay, and, and as we see that, we have um, ver- the start out, verse 1, Galatians 6, verse 1, right, where he says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Okay, so here in this first verse, we see the first directive. Right? And the first very specific directive he gives us now as we move to the next thing, right? as, we, and as we're following this, we've nailed the sinful passions to the cross, right? we're leaving those there, we're following the Spirit's leading in every part of our life, and we're becoming embracing God's family and being a part of God's body, the church. Right? And the first directive we get is to help other believers that go astray to get back on track. Okay, help other believers. Okay, that's a part, right? We're here to help each other. Right, and, and again, I'll tell you, there's a, a fine line here, and we understand this, right? The, between judgment and accountability. And so many times, that's one of kind of the pushbacks, right? The people from outside the church have is like, well, I don't want to go there because they're just going to judge me. Okay, now, again, we, we're told not to judge people outside the church, right? Like, that's God's job. Like, God does the judging of somebody, right, and the judging of their salvation. But when they're in the family, right, we are told to not judge them, but to hold each other accountable. Right? And again, that comes not, not just about, it, that's more about that person's heart condition, right? As a follower of Jesus, we need to have our be, be accepting of that, right? When somebody comes and says, hey, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about the direction I see, right? And, and then, again, the reaction to that should not be of, oh, they're judging me. The reaction should be, they care about me. Right? The reaction should be, oh, they, again, they, they've noticed enough and they're doing what God has said to do, right? To be, to be the church. And again, our, how we react to that is a, is a major deal, right? Again, if you are the one sheep that has wandered away, right? When, when God comes to find you, and to pull you back into the herd, don't kick the shepherd. Right? And don't, don't, you know, lash out at the church, right, for being the church. But again, we do that, don't we? <laughs> right? Again, as I'm addressing, right, Jesus talks about this whole idea, right, in Matthew 18, when he gives this parable, right, about how he will leave the 99 and come after the one who is straight away. Okay, now, again, Jesus does that in our lives today. If we want to like he will chase us. He'll go after that. And you know, you know what he uses usually to, to chase you? Other people in the church. Right, and they come representing Christ in your life. Right, so somebody again in the church. Now, again, we have to, if you're the one that's going off, you're being the hands and feet of Jesus, and you're coming to that person, we do so, right, in a loving way, right? And again, the way we present it, right, has to be, um, loving, right, and representing of Christ as well. But, but if you're the one that's wandered away, be careful not to kick the shepherd when he's trying to get you back. Right, I, he's to help others 
who have gone astray, right? And, and yet the warning that comes with this directive is to be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Hey, because we realize, right, that, I mean, we, we are not Christ, right? We are, are not perfect, right? And our journey as we continue to go is we know, right, that temptation is still around, right? That we still have to feed the right wolf, right? And feed the spirit in our lives. And, and again, when we step into that sinful arena with whoever's gone astray, whatever they're into, they're, we, it's a calculated risk, right? And he's saying, hey, do not, you got to control, you know, protect yourself. Don't get sucked in yourself. Because the reality is it's a lot easier to get pulled down than it is to lift somebody up. Right? And, and we have to be careful there. Not to fall into the same temptation yourself. And again, as we think about that, right, is um, we, we understand, right, and Scripture teaches us in 1 Corinthians 10, that it says there's no temptation that will overpower you. God will always give you a way out, right? But we also have to be wise about that. Right, so just an example, right, if, if you um, are a recovering, al- recovering alcoholic, right, and one of your Christian brothers falls into that, right, you might not be the one that's supposed to be chasing them, okay, because you're more susceptible to get sucked back into that, you know, than somebody who, who hasn't struggled with alcohol. Okay, and again, if you, you struggled with sexual purity or pornography, right, and somebody's ran into that, you might not be the right one to to hold them accountable, right? It might need to be somebody else that hasn't fallen into that because, again, in that maybe, again, we can look, go down the list, right? Go back to the list from Galatians 5, right? I mean, any of those things that that's, because, again, the enemy knows your weaknesses, right? And so be careful with that, right? He says, be careful. Don't fall into the same temptation yourself. And then in the next two verses, we get the next directive, Galatians 6, 2 through 3, he says, share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. And I wish he was more clear. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, what is he really trying to get to, right? Like, like, as we see, right, the directive he gives us here, okay, is that we are to share each other's burdens. Right? He says, you know, I mean, literally, he says, share each other's burdens, right? And, and he says, when you do this, right, you are, are obeying the law of Christ. Well, what, what does that mean? Now, remember, he's talking about the old law, right, and the, and the new covenant, and this is kind of the, the overarching issue, right, in this letter. And here he says, right, again, the law of Christ is that Christ took your shame on the cross, right, and he redeemed it, and he paid for it by his blood. And he did that so that I don't have to save myself and I don't have to carry those burdens alone, right? That's the law of Christ. It's the gospel. And he says, when we share each other's burdens, right, then we are living out the law of Christ because, right, that's the, I mean, ultimately God says, no, you are, you don't have to be alone. You're not doing life alone. You're doing life with God, right, with that relationship. And as we do that for others, right, because Christ did it for me, I can do it for you. Right? How, do I, how do I love somebody who, who continues to, to push back and, and seems unlovable? Well, I love them with the love of Christ because God loved me when I pushed him away. Right? How can I forgive somebody who's wronged me? Well, because God forgave me first. Right? I live out that same gospel right, in how I treat other people right? and how I share the burdens of others. Right? Because Christ did it for me, I can do it for you. And then it's not by my power and it's not by, you know, again, my, my love. It's God's love and God's power in me working through me to you. And that's truly being led by the Spirit as I submit to God, right, and to his power and to his way. As you go back into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is where there's this this great description of the church, right, the body of Christ. And in verses 25 and 26, there's a, this part where he says, in the body of Christ, when one part suffers, we all suffer. And when one part finds victory, we all celebrate it together. Right, and we are called again as the church to share each other's burdens. Right, because we are, as a follower of Jesus, we're not doing life alone anymore. 
right? And that's true as we have God's presence with us and his help, but that also means we have our brothers and sisters in Christ. We share each other's burdens. All right, and the warning that comes with this directive, right, is to keep your ego in check. <laughs> right? Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Right? That's from Romans. But notice what he says in here, right? The version in Galatians, he's like, hey, you are not too important to help somebody. Right? And don't let that sneak into your head, right? Don't let that sneak in and be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy, you know? Right? He says, no, you're not that important. <laughs> right? Just keep your own ego in check. Okay, the next directive we're giving is in the next two verses in Galatians 6, verses 4 and 5. Where he says, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Again, as he continues on, right, in zooming in on what it's like like to live life by the Spirit, and and he's giving some very specific directives. And and again, this next directive, right, he says, just make sure you do your own work well. Again, we all have gifts and talents. We all have a purpose that God has given us. He's like, and do it the best you can do it. Right? You fulfill your role. Right? And, and, and again, do it well. Right? Do, do it with excellence because we serve an excellent God. Right? And that's what God deserves. And everything I do is an act of worship towards him for his glory. Again, because my ego's in check. Right? I'm not doing it for my own selfish ambitions. I'm doing it for God. Right? And I'm going to do it the best I can do it. And again, it still goes back to our why. Right? And we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Right? I do good works because of my salvation. Because God set me free. Now I serve him right, with everything I have because that's what God deserves. And for his glory, not my own. I'm going to do my work well. Okay? And I'm going to strive to do it to, to, the, to the best of my ability. Right? And again, I do it not to please people. I do it to please God. And I'm going to fulfill my role. And, and now the, the warning that comes with this directive, right? As I do my own work and I do it well, right? And I fulfill my role in the body of Christ, okay? Is don't compare yourself to others. Okay, don't compare yourself to others, right? He says, Because if you are doing your work unto Christ, the best you can do it, right? You're fulfilling your role and and following God's, the spirit in your life, right? All the time. If you're doing that, then you don't have to compare yourself to others. Hey, because you are doing it on the standard that God's given you. But the reality is, right? Comparison is a very dangerous trap. In fact, nothing will rob your life of joy more than comparison. I'll say that one more time. Nothing will rob your life of joy more than comparison. Okay, because whenever you compare yourself to anybody else, you always lose. At least if you're honestly comparing yourself. Right now, if you're just comparing yourself to, to boost your own ego, right, then you always win. Okay, and that's one of the things that we, we fall into a lot in our culture. Okay, in fact, it's one of the things, you talk to my boys, this is one of the things I've said to them in our, our, all the time, especially because we have a bunch of boys, right, in my house. Okay, and I've always said, don't belittle someone else to make yourself feel better. Okay, because that, I mean, that's one way, right, the comparison absolutely will kill. Because one, then you're lying to yourself and you're also belittling someone else. Okay, but the other side of that, right, with comparison is if you honestly compare to someone else, you will always lose because there's always somebody better. There's always somebody at the next level, right? Again, even if it's just God himself, right? If I'm, if I'm looking at the example of myself, right, is there's always somebody better. But the main reason why we always lose when we compare is because we see someone else's highlight reel, right? And what, we, what they present, right, which is, especially if it's on social media, it's probably not even accurate, right? And we look at that, and, but then we compare everything that we know about ourselves, right? So we compare their highlight reel to our behind-the-scene footage, and we always lose. Right? And, and when we look at that, right, the comparison will rob you of your joy. Okay? And, and again, he says, just so there's no reason to. All you have to do is, is, again, keep your focus on Christ. 
right? And what he's transforming you into, right? What he's making you bigger. And, and then it, you know, again, just do what you're doing well, right? To the best you can, to the excellence, because it's for God. And then the, in verse six, right, to end out this section, we have the last directive. In verse six, he says, and those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Now here in this verse, hey, again, I, I almost just skipped over this verse. Hey, but again, it's in one of the directives, right? The directive is to share good things with your Bible teachers. Share good things with your Bible teachers. Interestingly enough, there is no warning on this one, right? He breaks the pattern. Hey, and so just as I'm up here teaching you the Bible, hey, just, just for your benefit, I have created an Amazon wish list of everything that I consider good. Hey, and so, no, I'm completely joking. I, I didn't do that, by the way, so. Hey, it, honestly, I almost skipped over this one because it's, it's awkward, right, to say, but that's it's what the word says, right? Again, as you say that, I'm, I'm not looking for you to give me stuff, okay? But I think the reality is, right, he gives us this directive, right, because, um, because being taught the word of God, right, comes with a high responsibility, Okay, by the teacher. Okay, and, and again, uh, any Bible teacher takes that responsibility seriously, right? Especially if they're doing all these things. And so, again, we are told in Scripture, right, to take care of those that teach us God's Word. And I will, and in all seriousness, right, all joking aside, I will tell you is that I feel incredibly blessed by this congregation. Okay, you, you guys as a church have, have shared incredible things with me and with my family. And so, in all seriousness, thank you. Right? I feel like you guys have lived this out, honestly. And continue. And as we look at that, right, um, here he switches in this next section in verses uh, 7 through 10. Okay, he switches from um, these specific directives and warnings to more general advice. Okay, and, and in this section, okay, verses 7 through 10, okay, he says, he says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Now, as we look at this general advice, they said we start with verse 7. And verse 7 is commonly known as the law of the harvest. And he presents this, this idea, this law of the harvest, right? Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Okay, now this is a very important concept that we must understand, right, for us to truly move forward in our faith. And he's telling the church of Galatia, right, he's like, understand, right, that, that this is true. Okay, the law of the harvest is true, okay, because it's the way that God just made the world to work. Okay, and when you look at the law of the harvest, right, he gives some very specific wisdom about how we apply that in our lives in the following verses. Okay, the first piece of wisdom he gives us in verse 8 regarding the law of the harvest is remember that what you put in is what you get out. Okay, what you put in is what you get out. Again, this really reiterates the concept that he taught last week, we looked at last week, right, with the, the sinful nature versus the, the fruits of the spirit, right? And again, those, those, two, those two wolves that are constantly fighting inside each of us, right? And so he just reiterates this again, right? But he just, remember, what you put in is what you get out. If you plant apples, don't expect oranges, right? If you... If you Put in a bad diet and no exercise, don't expect good health. If you ignore your spouse, don't expect a strong marriage. If you don't discipline your kids, don't expect them to respect you. If you don't put time and effort into your faith, don't expect it to grow. Right? What you put in is what you get out. In fact, this is, a, a, we've talked about these journey classes, right? And these spiritual growth classes that we, we provide for you here, right? And they each kind of build on each other. Journey class four 
okay, is, is the class, as you go through them, they kind of shift. It starts out during class one, I do most of the talking, right? And you just kind of listen. And as you go, you, like, you do more and the teacher does less. Okay, by journey class four, okay, is most of the class is on your shoulders, on what you get out of it is what you put into it. And in fact, we say that at the beginning of journey class four, right? If you want to get something out of this, you're going to have to put something into it. Okay, I see that happen every time we go through journey four, right? Every time I've taught it, every time Kim's taught it, every time anybody else states it, we say this, this, the law of the harvest is always true, isn't it? What you put in is what you get out, right? And if you put in a lot of effort, like God will, will speak and God will move and, and move you forward, right? If you don't put in, if you put in a very little, that's what you get out. You get out very little. Okay, and if you put in very little in your faith, okay, don't expect you to grow by leaps and bounds. Okay, it's the law of the harvest. What you put in is what you will get out. Okay, then the next thing he gives us in the beginning part of verse 9, okay, is he teaches us that long-term gains are worth the persistence. Long-term gains are worth the persistence, right? He says, don't get tired of doing good, right? And so many times, we've all been there, haven't we? Right, we feel like we're doing the right things, and yet there's just no tangible results, right? I'm like, man, do I have to keep doing this? Like, how come nothing's coming back, right? Like, we, literally, the, the, that common phrase, right, that no good deed goes unpunished, right? Like, we feel that, right? And he says, do not get tired of doing good. Because the reality is we live in a microwave society, right? We want instant results, right? We live in a microwave society, but the crock pot method works better every time. Okay, we live in a microwave society, but the crock pot method gives you much better results. Hey, and again, with that, I saw this, this picture, this famous quote um, this last week, and, and it just certainly applies here, right? Don't dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. Don't get tired of doing good. Just keep going, right? Don't get tired. He says, just keep going, right? That's part of the law of the harvest, right? It will pay off eventually if you do the right things long enough. Yeah, the, the next thing, the last part of verse 9, right? We, this general wisdom we, we learn is that, that God's timing is always right. right. He says at just the right time, you will reap a harvest, right, of, um, at this time. Now, again, when we look at God's timing, we realize that God's never late. And he's not, right? God's timing is always right. But he's, he's, he's never early either. Right, a lot of times our timing is a little different than God's, right? And God, but the reality is that God sees things we don't see, right? God knows things we don't know, right? And God's timing is always right. We learn in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, right, the, uh, the concept, right, the spiritual concept that there is a season for everything under heaven. Right? And, and again, that is even the right thing, if it's done in the wrong season, will give you the wrong result, right? And the timing has to be right, right? And God's timing is always right. And then the last thing we learn in verse 10 is that invest in family first. Invest in family first. And he says, right, he says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. And we see this concept all throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament, right, as we look at the standards of, of leadership, even within the church, is that our first ministry is to our family. In fact, that's one of the standards we see come up many, many times is you shouldn't be a leader in church if you can't lead your own family well. Okay, that's one of the tests that we're told to look at. Okay, and, and in fact, um, even stronger words in 1 Timothy 5.8, okay, it says, but those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith, and such people are worse than unbelievers. Ouch. Right, Fam invest in family first. Now, this is true with our own families, but this is also true, again, in the family of God, right? He said, especially those in the family of God. We, we, we care for our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? And we're always there to help everyone, right? But we have a priority, right, to help the family of Christ first, right? And we're, we're told to do that. And then we have the conclusion of the letter, okay, in Galatians 6, verses 11 through 18. And as we've seen throughout these weeks, this is a very personal letter. This is a very passionate letter. And as we look at these last 
um, this last section. Okay, his main point in this section, as he kind of wraps it up, and there's some very personal stuff in these words. Okay, there's um, some passion that comes out. Again, he's addressing these other false teachers and kind of all of these things. Paul's main point in this section is that these false teachers have not done anything that he's just directed all of them to do. And he's saying, so don't follow their example. Okay, and like we said, this is a very personal letter. Okay, he says... Um, he said, don't follow them. Instead, you need to follow Christ and that example and then find leaders that are also following Christ and then follow them. In fact, one of my favorite verses from Paul is not even in Galatians, but, um, and it's one that's been kind of misinterpreted a lot from Paul, but in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, right, Paul says, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And he says, I, you can follow me because I am following Jesus. Right? And don't follow anybody that's not, by the way. Right? He says, take that. Again, evaluate those teachers. Right? He says, check up on them. Read, right? we've, already, we've learned all that he said throughout the letter. But as we conclude in that, again, and as we wrap up this letter, right, and to say is that, again, his directive, main directive, right, is live life in the Spirit. Right? And follow the true gospel. And move forward in your faith. Right? And he gives us these practical examples. Okay, and as we wrap up this series, as we wrap up this study, okay, is my challenge to you is first to say, is, are you surrendered to the Spirit? Have you received Christ as your Savior? That's where the journey starts. And if you are, are you moving forward in your faith? Right? Are, you, are you living life by the Spirit every day? Right? Do you know the true gospel so you'll never follow a false teaching? Uh, are you following leaders, again, that, that have your best interest in mind, which means they have God's interest in mind for you? Hey, are you, if you are a leader, are you taking that responsibility seriously, right? They, are you imitating Christ so that you're an example worthy of following? Hey, as we, again, that is true, the true goal of our faith, right? The Great Commission is to be a disciple who helps other people become disciples. Hey, as we look at all that, again, I want to just sum up, right, this whole series, not just this message, but this whole series, final thought, okay, in the way that he sums it up in this letter, in Galatians 6, verses 15 and 16, okay, where he says, it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. And may God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle, for they are the new people of God. And that is the challenge, right, of the entire letter. He's saying, hey, stay true to the gospel. Be transformed by God's spirit, right? You, you don't have to earn your salvation. And even as a saved person, you don't have to continue to work for it, right? You've been set free by Christ. But you do need to live life in the spirit so you grow, right? So you be transformed, right? So that you are made holy because he is holy. Right, and move forward in your faith. And will we take that challenge seriously? Will we live our faith? Right, will we take the next step of our faith journey? This morning, I just encourage you to do that very thing. Take a step forward in your faith. Right, whether that's receiving Christ as your Savior for the first time, right, committing to you know, the next step of your faith journey, or just celebrating the fact that you are growing, right? That you are reaping a harvest of holiness in your life. But move forward, continue to move forward, right? Press on, heed the warnings and grow and represent God well. So you're an example worthy of following. Lord, we thank you that you are our God. Lord, no matter what season we're at in our life, God, no matter where we're at in our faith journey, Lord, you are there. God, whether we don't know you at all and we just need that step of salvation, God, you're there. Lord, whether maybe we stray, God, we've, we've fallen away from the flock, but God, you're there to bring us back. And maybe we're walking with you every day, but you're there continuing to transform our heart and our life. And God, we praise you for that. God, whatever the next step is in our faith, in our journey, Lord, we desire to draw closer to you. God, to take care of your family well. God, to live your light and your love in this 
this world that so desperately needs you. God, we pray that you will guide our path. Show us the next step. God, move us forward closer to you. Lord, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you, God, for setting us free. The truth of who you are. Lord, that we are loved. That we are changed. That we are your children. And God, as we go this week, especially this week of Thanksgiving, God, we give you the glory. And Lord, may how we celebrate, all of our conversations, Lord, everything we do, Lord, may it reflect you. Guide us as we go this week, as we continue to live our faith in every part of our lives, as we are surrendered to your spirit in every moment, in every day. Guide us as we go, in Jesus' name we pray.